have such a great crowd today. We have a fantastic speaker, and I know that all of you guys are absolutely going to love it and hopefully learn a lot, so thanks for coming out and joining us today. First of all, as always, I want to recognize our board of directors. Besides myself, there's 23 other amazing people that serve and plan events like this and do all the fantastic things that AMA Iowa does for you. So if you're on the board, please stand quickly. I would like to recognize you for everything you do. And of course, if you have any questions about AMA Iowa, if you're interested in getting involved, if you'd like to volunteer or just learn more about membership in general, please feel free to ask any of those people. And Mary Honeyman, our Director of Volunteers, is in the back of the room, so if you are interested in volunteering, please chat with her today. I'd also like to welcome our new members. We're always excited every month to see that our membership continues to grow and we're getting new people that are journey joining our organization. Do we have anyone here today that is a new member? by chance. Awesome. Well, welcome. We're so excited to have you. I'd love to meet you afterwards. Everyone else, please welcome him as well. Introduce yourself today. I know there's a lot of members in the room and people that come frequently to our events, so if you get a chance to introduce yourself, please do. Along with that, we would like to invite anybody and everybody in this room, whether you're a member or not, to consider being an AMA Iowa mentor. We're really working on partnering with our collegiate chapters across the state. It can be a really simple relationship where you send someone an email once a month, you do a phone call, you can do coffee with them once a month. Whatever you want it to look like is great with us. We have a lot of students that are looking for mentors and really want to learn from you, so it's a great way to give back to the marketing community. It's also a great way to engage with AMA Iowa, so I invite you to do that. Sadie Howard, she's not here today, but she's our Director of Collegiate Membership and Relations, so she's the one to reach out to, or you can feel free to talk to me or any other board member in the room to learn more information. Upcoming events, we have a special interest group at the end of this month at Jasper downtown that we would love for you to join us. And at the beginning of February, we have our all-day marketing conference called the Experience Event. And I know the board members that are planning it are very excited. They have a fantastic event planned this year. It's speakers from all across Iowa. It's on a Friday, so you can just come and have a blast with us, learn a lot. We're trying some new things this year, doing more engaging things with breakout sessions. So get on our website, amaiowa.com, and please register. We'd love to see you there. It's a great opportunity to meet new people. It was our first ever event for the experience last year, and we had over 150 people. So we would definitely like to break that this year, engaging by how many people are in the room today. I think we'll have absolutely no problem. So please plan to join us on February 6th. As usual, we'd love for you to get social with us, so get your tweet on with us. Handles are up there for you to use. Let's blow up Twitter, especially I heard the Cyclones had an amazing performance last night. So this is a great time to get on Twitter and really blow it up, right? So please join us in doing that. I'd also like to thank our annual Platinum sponsors. We have a number of them in the room, and we truly could not do what we do as a chapter without them. So I would like to thank Huffman Creative, Kelly Moore Consulting, Skyline Iowa, Nebraska, Lessing Flynn, Color FX, on Point Strategies, Global Reach, Timberline Church, and B2E Direct Marketing. Thank you for everything that you do for us as a chapter. And I'd also like to thank our annual sponsors as well. There's so many of them that support us and do absolutely wonderful things for our chapter, for our speakers. Jamie, you'll be getting a gift from Chocolate Sport Storybook for s speaking with us today. So we appreciate that and what they do for us as a chapter as well and everyone else. So if you have business needs, please look to these people to partner with them. And anyone and everyone on the AMA board would definitely recommend them. So if you have questions, feel free to let us know. And our contributing sponsor today is the Keg Stand. And we definitely want to thank them for being willing to sponsor. I know that I personally, as a Hawkeye fan, but also a big supporter of the Cyclones, learned a hard lesson last fall when I went for the Iowa-Iowa State game to the Keg Stand, having no idea that it was a Cyclone bar. And I felt pretty awesome when I walked in, and I think I was one of five people that had an Iowa shirt on, and people were like, why are you here? And I thought, well, I don't really know. I did not know that this was an Iowa State bar. So there you go. It's an Iowa State bar. It's a great place to watch Cyclone games. Or if you're a Hawkeye, it's also a lot of fun if you're willing to cheer for both teams. But when Iowa and Iowa State's playing each other, I'd probably recommend going somewhere else if you're an Iowa fan. So 
yeah, we won't tell them, but Iowa State is great. The keg stand is a great place to go and watch games. So please give them your business. So we're going to do a little giveaway from them today. I heard it's super awesome. I think it's actually at the front, isn't it? Twelve beers in there, different kinds of beers, and a $25 gift card to the keg stand. That's a pretty awesome giveaway. I do have to say so myself. So our lucky winner is Jessica Keller from Strategic America. So you can grab your giveaway when you head out. And we'd love to snap a photo with you of it as well because there's beer in it. So now I would like to bring Mark True up to the stage. He's our assistant VP of programs and he's going to introduce today's speaker for us. Thank you, Angela. I've got to tell you, this is um, today's presentation has kind of been um, on my radar for about two years, about the amount of time that I've been involved in programming because I wanted to hear Jamie Pollard come here and talk to us. I'm a big Cyclone fan. I'm a 79 graduate. Um, quick story, I, I got there, it tells, tells my age, I got there the year that Johnny Orr showed up on campus. And I was a freshman journalism student. It was about two or three weeks after he was introduced. And we had to find somebody to interview for the class. So I called over to the athletics department and got Johnny Orr to come over to my little journalism class and be interviewed um, by me. I uh, had a great time doing it, wrote the story. My instructor told me I got an A on the get, but about a C minus on the story. So I think that kind of uh, foretold my future in event planning and not journalism. Um, as I said, I'm a big Iowa State fan, so that's why I'm excited to hear Jamie. But more important, I'm a marketing guy. I love brand, and I love to hear all the things I love to see all the things that Jamie's been doing up at Iowa State. I didn't realize that when he sent me information, he's been there for 10 years now. It's been, a, it's been a, an exciting 10 years for us. We'll find out uh, what he thinks about that and how, how the last 10 years have been going, if it's fast or if it's slow. Under his leadership, the department has significantly invested in its facilities, re-energized the fan base, tripled its revenues, and recorded all-time program bests on the field and in the classroom. He's going to tell us a little bit about that today. Um, I think, and I believe he will, he will show you that the Iowa State brand is stronger than ever. And even the Hawkeye fans in the room are going to appreciate some of the things I think that he's done up at Iowa State. Um, if you put on your marketing hat and take off your Iowa sweater, okay? Um, ISU has registered its all-time best athletes graduation rate and national all-sports ranking during his tenure there. The Cyclones grad rate last year was second best in the Big 12, and they came in 38th place in the 2014 Director's Cup the second best in school history, and the best in the state for the third year in a row. Student athletes have registered a higher percentage grade point than undergrads in seven of the last 10 years that Iowa State has placed in the, t and Iowa State has placed in the top 50 of the Learfield Sport Directors Cup three seasons in a row. He's a former national champion long distance runner, so that's where he probably gets his competitiveness. He's gonna talk about some of his strengths and some of his core values in a little bit. Um, at UW Oshkosh, um, where he's in the school's Athletics Hall of Fame. He channeled his competitive drive in athletics administration career. Prior to coming to ISU, he served in various athletic administrative capabilities or capacities at Wisconsin, Maryland, and St. Louis. Today he's going to tell us a little bit about the ISU department, uh, ISU Athletics Department brand and all the accomplishments that they've been able to um, make in the last 10 years. So even if you're not a Cyclone fan, I think you're going to learn from him today. Let's give him a warm AMA, uh, AMA Iowa welcome. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, I appreciate having the opportunity to come speak before you today. I understand this is a pretty big turnout, and I, I hate disappointing. So contrary to what you were told, Fred is not going to come in and dance. Um, I know that's what most of you were probably hoping was going to happen, but he's booked. He's booked for a lot of shows after yesterday's video. Has anybody seen that video? How about the velvet sweatsuit, huh? My gosh. Um, a couple other uh, quick uh, housekeeping items before I begin. Um, I get a fact checker today because Nicole Peckham is here um, at the center table, right in the middle. She used to work for us, but she got herself right in my eye. So Nicole did a great job for us. So anything I say this afternoon that's not fact, she can fact check that. We'll know it better than anybody probably in the room, than even maybe even me. Um, I also have a special guest with me today. Um, Austin Fisher, who is a member of our football program, 
an Ankeny resident. Um, Austin is job shadowing me today. He asked when he could come job shadow, and I thought today would be a perfect day because I knew it was going to be like 10 below, and you'd have to bundle up and come over to the office. But no, I really want him to come down and have an opportunity to interact with some of you and also for him to be able to listen to this um, presentation. So. So, brand experience. What I thought I'd do with, from a game plan, I like to like set the ground rules so you know what um, we're going to do during the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. I've got a presentation, but then I also would love questions. And to me, I could go out and speak on behalf of Iowa State all day long, um, but I want to speak on what you'd like to hear. So when I get done, I'd gladly take questions on any subject. I always say no question is off limits. There may be some answers off limits. So. Brand experience. So you probably thought I was going to get up here and talk about how wonderful our marketing staff is and how they've won you know, the National Marketing Team of the Year Award in 2012. And um, They are a great staff, but we're not going to talk about the marketing staff today. Probably also maybe thought about, you know, we did a logo change six, seven years ago. Um, you know, it has a lot to do with brand, and we're very proud of the new logo but we're not going to be talking about the logo change today either. We're going to go a little deeper. And I, th I really think um, from a marketing and a brand standpoint, you, know, you can bring in all the best marketers, you can have all the greatest ideas, but those ideas come and go. Um, what it's really more about are, are what's the substance of the organization? What's the substance of the products? What are the substance of the people? And so we're going to spend some time with that. But I like to begin with the end in mind. And, um, I clearly didn't coin that phrase, but to begin with the end in mind today is what is the takeaway, okay? And the takeaway is a slogan that we've embraced over the last couple years in our department. And it's, it's much easier said than it is to implement. And it is, as you continue to achieve your goals, always remember who you were because that's who you still are. Many examples in our society how we failed miserably as organizations and as people on this front. Um, I can think of divorce right off the bat. You know, I don't know many people that get married and on their wedding day say we're going to get divorced. But why does the divorce rate what it is? It's because people change. Things happen in their lives and they change and they forget who they were and they forget who they still are. So that's our takeaway at the end that we'll come back to as you listen to uh, uh, what we have to talk about today. So, with that in mind, I always like to start here, and I won't, I'll pick on Angela a couple times today because she is our resident hawk and she is your leader. But um, I usually like to use this little video during the week of the Iowa Iowa State games, um, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, this is then, and what I'm referring to is what was it like to be a Cyclone fan um, before? Okay, so. This would be going home from work on Friday because the Cyclones are going to play. So we're all fired up. Going around, we're going to go tell all our friends. It's go time. Get the tailgate ready. We're ready to go. And then Monday. You laugh at yourself, huh? Now, you like, I always used to like to say that. That was Gary Barta running around the offices at Iowa saying we're playing the Cyclones, we're playing the Cyclones, and then that was Gary on Monday. But that's not the story today. The story today is really that was then. Um, and this is now. Um, things have changed a little in Iowa State land. And you know, we have a little more excitement going on. Uh, Fred or what's happened in football or any of our programs. But... Um, exciting times. So, the question is, how do you get Cyclone fans to do what you want them to do? All right? And I'm going to do a little uh, experiment with you today to show you that even those that are not Cyclone fans, that I can control your mind and get you to do what I need you to do. Okay? So, keep this to yourself. This is a little thing you're going to do. To, everybody's doing their own little exercise with me here. So I want you to think of a number between 1 and 10. Okay. I want you to multiply that number by 9. I know this will get tough for Angela and her friends, but um, <laughs> multiply that number by 9. Okay, so whatever that number is, I want you to 
add the two digits together. So if your number was 43, you've got 7. If your number was 54, you've got 9. So you had a number between 1 and 10. You multiplied it by 9. You're adding those two digits together. Okay. Now I want you to subtract 5 from that number. I want you to think of the letter of the alphabet that corresponds to the number you're thinking of. If you have one, that's A. If you have two, that's B. If you have three, that's C. Think you kind of get the sequence. It's a pattern. Okay, I want you to think of a state in the United States that begins with that letter that you're thinking of. All right, now today, uh, today would not be a good day to go to the zoo, but we're going to go to the zoo. We're going to go over to Blank Park Zoo. And I want you to think of an animal you'd see at the zoo today that begins with the letter E. How many people are in Delaware looking at an elephant? <laughs> okay. Little simple mind trick. But we show that you can control their people's minds. Now, you got to have a little fun with yourself. So uh, I like to share this. I'll pick on Austin a little bit, too, here. Uh, I did that with our teams two years ago. I did our basketball team first, and two young men in the front, they didn't raise their hand. I said, well, where are you if you're not in Delaware? And they said, we're in Detroit. <laughs> I was like, OK, I did say state, didn't I? <laughs> And then when I did it to the football team, Austin wasn't on the team at the time, but when I did it to the football team, as soon as I said, multiply by nine, some player in the back yells out, you know, I'll pick on Austin, but he goes, oh gosh, Austin's gonna need tutors. <laughs> so you gotta be able to laugh at yourself, but little amazing mind tricks. Okay, how far have we come though? What has happened in Cyclone Land that we've gotten people to do? And I'm just, you know, Mark rattled off a couple of the, the uh, uh, analytical uh, benchmarks, but. I'll just go down a couple of these, and then I think that it'll help paint the picture of how we got to that spot. What we call, it's the Director's Cup thing. And the Director's Cup is how you do on a national level on all your sports. And, and it's a very objective, not subjective. So it's based on if you, you know, you get our women's cross country team got second at the NCAAs this year, so they get 96 points for getting second. And so you score points as a department on a national level. Then was 123rd. This past year we were 38. Big 12 rank. We were 12th to 12th. I'm not proud to say this, but we had a streak there 10 years ago where seven straight years we were everybody's W. So we were 12th to 12th in all sports in the Big 12. My first year, 12 of our 18 teams were last. This past year, we were 5th to 10th overall of the athletic programs. Our budget's gone from 28 million to 64 million. Our fundraising's gone from 3.7, our annual fundraising that's tied to tickets, not fundraising for capital projects, but just the annual money that comes in every year based on where people sit in their tickets has gone from 3.7 to 9.1 million annually. Our football season ticket sales have gone from 22,000 to 41,000. Our basketball season tickets have gone from 8,100 to 11,500. All very significant junior cyclone club members have gone from 2,000 to over 5,500. 5, um, all tremendous gross, any one of them taken by their, their individual self would be a great accomplishment, but when you put them all together, you look and say, well, how have we done that? Has it been because of good luck? Or is it something deeper than that? And I'd argue that it's a lot deeper than that. It is starts with our people. And you know, we can talk about all the strategies and all the branding we want, but it's first, it's who. Who are those people in the room that are helping make things happen? Show a quick little video here, I think, that really speaks to how I see the value of our people in our organization. I think that what makes Iowa State University different or special are the people. And I know that's something that a lot of places like to say, but it really comes true here. I think it starts with what um, Iowa State University stands for, the land grant, science and technology. We represent what a lot of students or high schoolers growing up in the heartland of uh, this country. But at the same time, I think this institution has done a really, really good job 
of welcoming students and their parents when they come through the admissions process. We take great pride in that our student athletes uh, come in and that they're serious students, uh, that over 50% of them have a grade point average above a 3.0. Uh, that's attributed to the academic services staff, uh, the student athletes themselves, and then the coaches. Whether you win or lose, winning and losing is important. It's athletics. You have to win. Uh, you have to lose sometimes. But winning um, takes second uh, to the heart and soul in which you compete. I do believe we have tremendous leadership here at Iowa State, um, both in the athletics program with Jamie Pollard, all the way up to President Leaf. I think um, the president balances you know, the needs of the, the campus with, with athletics, but I, I found him to be very supportive of athletics as well. I would say that Iowa State University, if we were a public company and we, we had stock, um, I'd buy it because I'd be very bullish on Iowa State University. I look at what's happened with our student body, what's happened with our athletics program. Wonderful, wonderful things are happening at this institution and I only see it continuing to, to grow. So I would buy now because the stock is still pretty low priced. So when we think of our people, um, I get asked a lot of times to come out and speak on what it's like to be in a leadership position and having to hire uh, individuals in a very public setting. And so when I think of our people, I think two of the people that people naturally gravitate to, they think of Paul Rhodes and they think of Fred Hoiberg. And as you try to amass the people and getting the right people in your organization, um, I think a lot of times people forget that it's a lot harder than one thinks. Because I have these other two people, Greg McDermott and Gene Chiswick, that if you were to ask Cyclone fans, they would say, those weren't really good hires. Yet the same person made those hires, OK? And why am I showing that? Well, a lot of times people want to think hiring folks is a science. Austin and I had this discussion in the car right up, because he was asking me questions about when we hired Coach Rhodes and Coach Chiswick. But the reality of it is, it's more an art. Okay? And think of this for a moment. Gene Chizik, at the time we hired him, was at the University of Texas as the defensive coordinator. They had just won the national championship, and he was the Frank Broyles National Coach of the Year. Not only was he the, or the National Assistant Coach of the Year, not only was he the National Assistant Coach of the Year the year before we hired him, he also was the National Assistant Coach of the Year two years before we hired him. Because prior to being at Texas, he was at Auburn as a defensive coordinator where they won the national championship. So he was two-time defending defensive coordinator, national champion, national coach, assistant coach of the year. When we hired Gene, most people couldn't believe that he wanted to come to a little old Iowa State. And how did we lure him there? Okay. Likewise, Greg McDermott. Remember when we hired Greg McDermott and somebody wrote me and goes, well, you can't take credit for hiring Greg McDermott. That's, that was a no-brainer. His brothers went to Iowa State. He grew up on a farm. He had been at Northern Iowa, had had a great success, was very well liked by Iowa State fans, very familiar to Iowa State fans, was the perfect fit. Okay? So we followed the science and hired Gene Chiswick and Greg McDermott and didn't turn out very well. The next go around, we hire a football coach that was unemployed, had just been fired by Auburn. And we hire a basketball coach that never coached a lick in his life. So we didn't follow the science at all the second time around. And it turned out pretty well. And so we followed the art. And so as I think about that, and you think about what's the art for Iowa State University, what about our culture, our organization, makes Fred Hoiberg and Paul Rhodes the right coaches and the other two not the right coaches? I'll come back to what the takeaway is. As you continue to achieve your goals, remember who you were because that's who you still are. So I underlined the part of you still are. So let's go in and look at, as the leader of our department, who am I? Because I set the pace, I set the tone. All right? So a couple things about myself. My parents were first generation immigrants, came from Scotland and England. Okay? Um, my father and my mother ran an auto body shop. Okay, fixed cars, work together. I was the baby of five. Okay, I had three older siblings that were born in Scotland and England and came over on a boat when they were three, two, and one to the Statue of Liberty with my folks. Okay, 
Three of my siblings never finished high school. Okay? One of my sisters ended up getting pregnant and had to drop out. Another one ended up in jail and had to drop out. And my brother had spina bifida and had to be institutionalized. Okay. First generation college student. Okay. Now I share those because I'm the last person that probably should be standing before you as the Iowa State Athletics Director, let alone talking to you about branding and marketing. Because my background doesn't fit for the person that's up here. Okay? What about my DNA, though, makes it work? Okay? We're going to talk about core values, strengths, and weaknesses. And why this is, I think, is important is it sets the tone for what I believe not only our athletics program, but our institution is all about. And it creates our ultimate brand. Okay? Core values. Most people, when they get up and talk about core values, are going to talk about their faith, their family, and their job. Okay? I'm no different on that respect because those are my, what I'll put my three core values centered on. My faith, my family, and my job. What I like to say, though, is take this next slide and say, though, I'm not politically correct. I'm a realist. And if I had a way to make this PowerPoint continue to keep moving, I'd have them keep moving because they're not in that order. And the politically correct thing is to get up and say, well, it's my, my faith, and it's my family, and it's my job. But I recognize that on any given moment, because it's a ball of yarn to me, they're entwined in a way that I can't separate them. I can't pull them apart any longer. They're all one. Those are the three bases of my core values, and they are entwined and cannot be separated. But in any given moment, my family knows that my job may have to be number one. And my family benefits from that. Okay? And there are times that my job knows that my family is going to be number one. And I wish I could say that my faith is always number one, but I'd be lying. Okay? I'd be lying. I need help in that area just as much as probably everybody in this room. But those are the three things that I choose to spend my time trying to be good at when it comes to my core values. And as an organization, we've tried to adapt to that. Okay? And I'll give you some examples. Um, our high school, our high school coaches probably dislike me for the, the reason of I'm always asking them way ahead of time, what are the schedules? I want to know next year's cross country schedules and next year's track schedules. Why? Because I want to put it on my calendar. So when Mark calls me to ask me if I will do this, that hopefully I'm not scheduling it on top of something that I know is another value in my life that I really want to try to be at, okay? He would ask me to be at an event, I think it was February 6th, and I'm scheduled to be with my son at an out-of-state cross-country meet in Colorado, and I just said, you know, Mark, I really, I'll, is there another date? Can I do it at a different time? Because I want to make my job important here, and I want to help you, but that's one thing I just don't want to push up against. But likewise, we do that with our staff. Okay. Try to have it, make it a point that I've got a lot of people on my staff with young kids. I want them at their kids' events. And we've got to figure out a way to try to make that work. Doesn't mean it can always be that way. There are some times jobs going to have to be number one. But we know as a culture within our department that we've created that. And quite honestly, that's what our fans want. And I'll share a story with you about um, when I first came to Iowa State, uh, you know, I've got four kids, so it's Pollard party of six, right? Well, for basketball, they had the pri previous AD only had four seats. So I took those four seats, and there were about three rows down off to the side, there were two other seats. And so my family just split up when we went to the games. You know, and they're pretty good seats. They're down behind the bench. They're good as anybody else would ever want. Um, and the people that sat next to the two came to me and said, we'd like to give up our seats so your family can sit together. And I said, you can't do that. No way. And they said, no. You, you know. And I said, no, that's not right. You know, Because I'm thinking about it, people will see. Well, the Pollards just moved up into the row right behind the bench, and <laughs> there's six of them together. And I remember what this donor said to me. This donor said, no, Jamie, you don't get it at Iowa State. 
it means more to us that your family is there together because it looks strange when they're not. And it, it just resonated with me that we're in an environment, you know, if I was the AD at New York City or Los Angeles, I don't think that person probably would have said that to me, okay? So I share that a little bit just to say um, creating that understanding within the organization of the core values. Another great example for me was two years ago down at Baylor, or uh, at the Dallas <coughs> Women's Big 12 Tournament. We're all down there, presidents down there. Our women advanced to the finals championship game on Monday night to play the Baylor Bears. Well, my daughter was gonna run her first high school track meet, indoor track meet at Iowa State on that Monday night. And I was debating going, do I stay for the game on Monday, do I miss? And our president said to me, I want you to go home. And he had flown down on the university plane. He said, you take the university plane and go back. And I'll, I'll find a different way back. Because I want you back for your daughter. And that's pretty cool when it's through the organization that you've created that kind of environment. Strengths. Anybody ever done Strengths Finders? Good. Well, for those that haven't, Strength Finders is, um, I'm married, anybody heard of Myers-Briggs? Okay, all right, so I married a woman that's in student affairs, or was in student affairs. So I remember when we were dating, and she was into Myers-Briggs and wanted me to do the Myers-Briggs, and I was like, keep that crap away from me. You know, the last thing you want is the person you're dating to kind of like get in your head and kind of know whether you're touchy-feely or, um, well, Strength Finders, I say, is Myers-Briggs for business, okay? It's the same concept, you go online and you take a test, oh, not a test, you go on and take an exercise and it asks you all these questions that you go, didn't it just ask me that? And it's trying to trick me and see if I can do this or not. But in the end, it pumps out five of your, what your tendencies are, your strengths, okay? Well, the concept behind strength finders is know your strengths, invest in other strengths, and identify the right strengths, okay? All our lives, we're told to make your weaknesses better, right? What are you not good at? And let's try to improve that. And the concept of strength finders is the polar opposite of that. It says, why are you spending any time on your weaknesses? Because even if you get them better, you're not going to be very good at it. You know? So you know, my dad and mom could have put me on the golf course every single day with a pro when I was little to make me be the next Tiger Woods. I got news for you. It wasn't going to happen. Because I may like the game of golf, but it doesn't like me. Okay? So that's not a core strength of, me, of mine. So investing time and energy in that probably is not the wisest, efficient investment. So figure out what your strengths are. Figure out what your organizational strengths are. Invest in those strengths. Identify the right ones. So, you know, when I do this, people always are going to come back and say, well, what, what did you test out as? Um, so I'm an activator, strategic, competitor, achiever, significance. I'll give you a couple examples, though, as you use this within your organization. Um, so activator. That's probably my number one trait. And... Um, There'd be times, especially when I first started, where it would be like, well, if I only had five of me, we could really get some things done, <laughs> okay? And one of the staff members that came with me from Wisconsin, Steve Melchow, who I, I call my moral compass, would say, Jamie, if we had five of you, we'd all go off the cliff without a parachute, okay? Because what an activator does is you come in and you give me ideas. Before you left my office, they're already being implemented, okay? So you may be telling me the idea, and I'm already writing the email to all the staff that says we're doing it. And until you figure that out amongst yourselves, now my staff knows when they come in to say, okay, Jamie, don't do anything with this, just listen. I've got some ideas I wanna brainstorm about, but please don't do anything with these. Um, knowing what those situations are, okay? Unlike a football coach, when you get hired, football coach gets hired, we make it really easy for them. They get, all the staff gets wiped out, they get to hire all their own people, okay? You get hired as AD, you just inherit the people you have, right? So I've got a leadership team where there's six, what I call vice presidents, six um, of my senior staff. And I remember when I started, there was one that, I'm type A, I'm probably type A plus, right, Nicole? Wait, you're plus plus, so <laughs> I'm plus. Well, type A's, you know, I, I, one of my previous mentors would say, I'm wired for 220, and if I have to work with 110s, the 110s are gonna short circuit, okay? Well. You come in as a leader, and there were some people on that leadership team that were 
B minuses. And it's really hard when you're trying to get things done and they're just like, okay, are we gonna get there? Um, but when we did this exercise, what it really helped me understand was the value of those different tendencies within the organization and within the culture and how to best utilize those people. They are your parachute, so you don't go off the cliff. But when do you use them? How do you use them? And who do you pair with who and who do you don't? When you do it, if you have a search committee, who do you not want on the search committee? So um, very important, I think, to understand what the strengths of, of the individuals and the organization. Okay, weaknesses. Um, I'm a public employee, public leader, so this is some of my blind spots. And um, again, Austin and I talked about this because you know, as a, as a student athlete, social media has impacted how student athletes feel about other student athletes. But you know, weaknesses for me are the way people can now interact with you as a public leader. You know, very few people take any time to write out a letter now uh, and mail it to you. I would have loved to have been an AD when you actually had to go home, think about it, write it, take it to the mail, mail it, and it would get there on Wednesday, okay? Now they just, in the first quarter, say, what the heck are we, blah, 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 blah. Um, but through email, through um, you know, voicemail, through cell phone, through texting, through tweeting, you name it, um, they're my blind spots, and why do I say that? Well, as a public employee, um, I always am amazed when people say, well, I don't read the newspaper, or I don't listen to the radio, or I don't watch TV. I always say, bull. I'm human, okay? I work in sports. Why wouldn't I listen to talk radio, right? Why wouldn't I read the sports page, okay? But I'm also human. So if you cut me, I will bleed. <coughs> if you insult me, I will hurt. And so that stuff stings. And that stuff, when it stings to an activator, is like combustion, okay? So you have to identify what those weaknesses are and then figure out how to cover those weaknesses. Whether it's knowing what other people's strengths are in the organization or building in some own protection. Janet Lovell is my assistant, and uh, she's awesome at it, okay? Um, Nicole's smiling. Janet's really the AD. I just happen to work for Janet. Um, but, you know, you send an anonymous letter, it's not finding its way to my desk. I won't ever see it. Because if you can't put your name on it, I, have, I, I respond to just about everything, unless you're vulgar, way, way out of bounds, um, you're going to get a response. Well, if you're going to send me something without a um, name or an address, I have no way to respond. So if you don't want my input, then why should I read your input? That's pretty much how we take it. And quite honestly, I don't need that heartburn. So it's a way to kind of create some of those, um, protect yourself from those blind spots. But trust me, those, those, those are tough. But knowing those weaknesses is really important so that you don't cause yourself more problems. Okay, so how does that all tie back? Okay, so I've talked about it from an individual standpoint of myself. But when I look at an organization, you start thinking about your organization's core values, you add their strengths, you add their weaknesses, and what does that get you? What it gets you is a culture, okay? and short little video on the Iowa State culture. I believe what has made the connection between our athletics department and the Iowa State University fans is the, the belief that who we have here working care about them and that exists in part because we have some very successful Iowans on our staff, but I think it's more of just the culture we've created that we represent Iowans like they'd like to be represented. We see it all the time when we have either teams that come into town or families come into town or friends come into town. Uh, they feel the positive energy that surrounds the university. There are things I think we do as good or better than anybody else in the country and, and one of the things that we always talk about is the experience you're going to have here. We are pretty um, accessible. You know, we, we really work hard. Um, in the volleyball program and, and other sports too, to interact with fans, to um, sign autographs, to make it an interactive experience. And you know, I, I've gotten a lot of feedback that fans really enjoy being a part of it. I think I value most here at Iowa State the commitment. The commitment that people make to not only 
you know, encourage and support the community, the athletics, the school, but the commitment to maintain the pride that they have and the values that are instated here in Iowa State. We're winning at each level in every sport, and um, we continue to get better. We're filling our football stadium every weekend, which is always important to any university and any campus. And uh, uh, the energy is strong uh, here at Iowa State uh, for athletics. And so when they look at our program, they feel very comfortable in supporting us because they know that we're doing the very best that we can and we're always trying to do things the right way. So that culture that we've created, um, several slides here I think that speak to what I think we've done to kind of capitalize on the culture. And you know, maybe these are our initiatives, maybe these are our marketing initiatives if you want to think of it that way. But what I think of when I think of the culture we've created, number one, the children. Iowa State children. The, the, uh, one of the slides had, uh, um, we went from 2,000 to 5,500 in the, what we call the Junior Cyclone Club. Um, being able to reach out to families, right? Um, the Cyclones lost to the Hawkeyes back in the 80s. I believe it was, I don't know, 10, 15 years in a row, somewhere in there, when Hayden was here, okay? Students that left Iowa State during that time period left with a whole different feeling towards going to a football game than students that leave today, right? And so we talked about the lost culture, didn't we? Or the lost generation, excuse me, not lost culture, lost generation. Um, because those students are now in that 30 to 45 demographic, and they have children. And we were gonna lose two generations if we didn't make this a priority. And so we did a lot of things, changing how we did the tailgate things around trying to reach our children. Likewise, the students, the current students, are a big part of the Iowa State culture. Game day next weekend in Hilton Coliseum on Saturday is awesome. I'm so excited, but what I'm really excited about is the current students are gonna get to be part of that because it'll be something that they're gonna take with them and they'll remember forever that they were the first to be part of a game day. Fans, don't take in, not taking our fans for granted. You know, I, this is a slide that talks about fan fest, but just being able to do things where you really tried to reach out to the fans and make them feel that they matter. Our spirit squad sigh. That's a big part of the Iowa State culture. You know, the um, number of times that you know you see them at games, but the number of times that they're out at parades over the summer weddings, you name it, that they're out representing Iowa State. Our marching band. Got any former band members in here? No? Oh, we got one back there. What instrument? French horn. French horn. All right. The band is a big, big part of our culture, and we've worked really hard to make sure that they feel that they're part of the athletic department and part of the success. Tailgating. You know, that may be the biggest asset that Iowa State has when it comes to our athletics program and our institution. Anybody ever been to Lambeau Field in Green Bay? Okay. Jack Trice Stadium is very similar setting to Lambeau in that everywhere you park you can see the stadium. And tailgating, the atmosphere around Jack Trice Stadium feels far greater than a lot of stadiums that are much bigger just because the atmosphere that's created. And so things that we've done to create that culture, that brand, whether it was opening the parking lots longer, not being as restrictive. Where are my Hawkeye fans? Okay, got to be out of the lot an hour after the game. They bust you for having open, and, uh, whatever you want to have call open. <laughs> you know, we've really tried to not do that at Iowa State because it's about the experience. If it was just about the results of the games, we wouldn't have a streak now of 27 straight crowds over 50,000 when prior to that t streak of 27, we had had five crowds over 50,000 in 100 years of football. Think of that. And we're on a streak now of 27 straight crowds of uh, sold attendance over 50,000. It's not just what's happening on the field, it's what's happening all around the program. And then lastly, what have we done from our facilities? You know, much of what we've done in our facilities, especially in Jack Trice Stadium, has been geared towards the fans. Wider concourses, better restrooms, more concessions, the video boards, the video boards in Hilton. Things done 
to enhance fan experience in order to, to get more people to want to buy in. So if I come back to beginning with that end in mind, how do you get the Cyclone fans to do what you want them to do? Um, you know, I like to use this slide because I think it ultimately captures the essence of um, what all of that adds up to. Okay. And this song, you know, you're not a Neil Diamond fan, it's, it's cheesy, right? But it's kind of just captured the essence. And I love this slide of, you know, everybody rushing to the middle of the field. How did you, how did they know to all go do that? Well, you'd created an environment where that's ultimately what they wanted to do. We had controlled their minds to get them to the spot that they want to go on the field and sing Sweet Caroline, okay? So, today's takeaway, as you continue to achieve your goals, always remember who you were, because that's who you still are. I'll throw it out to questions. Diana. Yes. Okay. Valour, sorry. Or stupid. <laughs> right. Right. Cycle and state. Talk about that a little? Okay. Right. Well, I, I would say um, a couple different answers to the couple questions that were there. Um, the, your, the first part, which is, is it, um, do you build around the culture or do you state your position? And um, I think it's a combination of the two because uh, I think it's important to <coughs> make sure your constituents know what you want them to do or where you're trying to go. And so that's the portion of stating your position. But I think your position, I don't think, I, be, I, on, I believe, your position has to be based on what you think your culture will accept and what your organization can do. You know, if, if we were to, if I would have stood up and said when I started 10 years ago, we're going to win the national championship in football, okay? Um, yeah, that would have been a really bold thing to say. <laughs> um, been really hard to achieve. Um, but to say that and, and, and realistically get there would probably require us to do a lot of things at Iowa State that wouldn't fit that culture. Um, we would probably would have to hire some people that would cut corners and play in the gray area that weren't, that's not who we're, how we're gonna do things. I always say, I wanna win as bad as anybody, but I don't wanna win where we sell our soul because then it will be very shallow. It won't feel very good. Um, as related to that billboard, um, well, that would be one of those activator deals. Um, the, the genesis of the billboard came from when you're the new AD and they take you around to go meet groups of people. And so one day we drove over to Cedar Rapids to meet with a group of people from Cedar Rapids. And it was at the Cedar Rapids Country Club. And um, I remember them talking about how, you know, you guys, we feel so lonely over here. You know, it's Hawkeye country. There's, what can you do to make us feel like we're more part of what's going on over there? And, um, and the car ride home, there were three or four of us in the car, and we were just kicking around that idea. And someone said, well, you know, we have those billboards. I mean, we could do something with the billboards. And the activator part kind of came in, and I'm not going to say it was just my idea. It was collective. But it was, we 
ended up beating the Hawkeyes that fall in football. And so it just seemed natural to say, well, why don't we say it's the Cyclone State? And um, now the joy of that, though, was this. You know, when you talk about a brand and, and value, so there's a lead time on doing that, right? So it was going to go up. We decided it would go up the month of August, leading into the start of football season. But we announced it on our tailgate tour that May in Cedar Rapids. And so when we announced it, there was this lag time between we had, you know, we knew what it was going to look like. So the papers wrote about it. And this is honest to God truth. I had people writing me saying, oh, I love that billboard. I saw it when I was going into Iowa City. That was such an awesome move. And I'm thinking, it's not even going up for another month. <laughs> and we joked and said, maybe we ought to not spend the money to put them up because I think we already got the value out of them. But um, now, now I'll fast forward. So it was, it was a, I don't even know if I'd say a calculated decision, Diana. It was a... It was a decision. Um, but many a truth said in jest, okay? Because that was done almost 10 years ago, nine years ago, all right? Sink your teeth into these three demographics that have changed in that nine years time span, okay? To say it's a cyclone state. Number one, Iowa State University is the number one choice of Iowa high school students of any of the schools in this state. So of Iowa high school students where they choose to go to college, the majority go to Iowa State University. Nine years ago, that was not the case. Number two, there are now more living Iowa State alums in the state of Iowa than any of the other two institutions. That changed about four and a half years ago. And number three, Iowa State University is now the largest institution in the state. And that happened two years ago. So during that decade, that's what's changed. Now, you know, we can all probably think of a lot of reasons why that's changed. I mean, the, the focus on agriculture and just, you know, uh, what I like to say is what Iowa State's really good at, science and technology, is what our nation needs right now, our world needs, and so we're filling that void, blah, 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 blah. But when Dr. Lee started, I remember sitting in the big president's cabinet room around the table, and they were talking about those demographics, and he asked the question, well, why does anybody think that this has happened? And I said, well, I think nine years ago it started when we took out a <laughs> billboard that said it's a cyclone state. <laughs> so um, many a truth said in jest, but, you know, we put the stake in the ground and it's actually happy. <laughs> now, people that work with me a lot know I love talking about this part of it, is, um, you know, history is rear, rear view mirror, right? But somebody was actually there living it when the history happened. You just don't know it until a long time later, right? Okay? I love it when people talk about Nebraska football and how great they were. Bob Devaney, you know, everything he did at Nebraska. Well, they weren't that before Bob Devaney got there. So I would have loved to talk to somebody pre that time, right? Well, it hit me this fall, Earl Bruce was back, former legendary coach at Iowa State, only coach ever to leave Iowa State with a winning record, okay? And Earl was the head coach the year the Cyclones moved in to Jack Trice Stadium from Clyde Williams Field. And so that's a historical moment. They're moving into a brand new stadium. And so I, I, I was fascinated. I asked him a ton of questions. Oh, what was that like? What did it feel like? And so why I've said that is we're doing something right now that I think is incredibly transformational, and that's bowling in the end zone of Jack Trice Stadium. The Cyclone fans have talked about that for decades. It was always what I always got asked about. When are we going to bowl in the stadium? Well, now we're doing it. We're actually living in history. Because someday someone will say, I don't even remember when it wasn't bowled in, right? So we're here living it. Now I'm going to come back to that, okay? We're living in a generation that this state is changing demographically. Now, whether that'll hold or not, I don't know. The 80s was the farm crisis, and it went the other way, so maybe it won't be that way another decade from now. But right now, we're living in a generational change. And so I talk to our staff, I talk to our people, our constituents, I say, enjoy it. Look around. It's happening. Remember it. Because we joked about it 10 years ago. Here's what's already changed 10 years later. What will it be like another 10 years? The kids growing up today don't know any different than running on the field and singing Sweet Caroline. 
You know, they know Fred Hoiberg winning. They don't know. And so what will that be like? And will we look back and go, gosh, I don't remember when Iowa State wasn't good. I don't know. But it is pretty neat. Got me going, didn't you? That was not a planted question. Well, we've tried to take the winning and losing out of it. Um, I'm not going to say that's an absolute because there are certain times, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say, okay, we, you know, we knew this football season wasn't going the way we wanted it to. You knew that the last games of the year, it's going to be cold. We knew that the games were on Thanksgiving break when the students weren't going to be there. So, yeah, you try some strategies to try to get other people in there. Um, but by and large, the focus, um, we never talk about the winning and losing part of it. We talk about the fan experience and what we can do. And that's, you know, that, that was a big thing for me when I started about tailgating. Because tailgating, is, other than Visha Parade, which we no longer have, um, what brings that many people to the campus? And we get six or seven weekends a year where we get to bring 60 to 70 to 80,000 people to the campus. So why wouldn't we do everything we possibly can to make that experience as best as possible? Once the game starts, I've got no control over the outcome of the game. So if I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket, boy, I'm playing a dangerous game. Now, it helps if you win because, you know, you get less questions about the hot dogs being cold and the popcorn being stale and blah, 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 blah. But, um, but by and large, people go for the experience. And... Um, you have to create ways to take advantage of that or to capitalize on that is maybe a better way to say it. <laughs> Broadway tailgating. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I, here, let's th I'll give you some other examples off of that, though, okay? Is, um, you know, we're building this new club section, 3,000 seats, a lot of seats to sell. Um, and what you get when you get to come in there is you're going to have this huge indoor club, kind of like a Buffalo Wild Wings. And you're going to have the opportunity to purchase alcohol, buy different kind of food, have private restrooms, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, what we're selling in that experience is this. When you come out of college, tailgating's really fun. Tailgating can be a blast, but tailgating's a lot of work. Someone's got to organize that, do it all, but, you know, let's do it. Yeah, rah, rah, we're going to go do this. And then along come kids. And suddenly, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm going to get to the game, but, you know, Johnny's got a soccer game, and then we're going to get over there. So suddenly, the tailgating part gets a little harder, right? And, and after a while, you start to get a little out of tailgated, where you start going, oh, gosh, it's just too much work. I don't think I want to do it. And along comes the club. And now you, it's, you've got a tailgate in a box, essentially. You can just show up, and you've got your tailgate. And so we'll do things in that club, whether it's bring in the radio show, bring in the... Um, you know, have musicians, whatever, to make it so someone can show up an hour and a half before without any work, and it's all turnkey, and now we've made it that much more valuable. So, you know, I don't know your world that well, but it's how do you build stuff around just the show? Um, because that's what we've tried to do. That's a great question. You should have told me that one ahead of time so I could actually think of a couple because <laughs> i got to think of that. i got more where I go, dog on it, why did I do that? <laughs> um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Dog on it. I'm kind of coming up with a mental blank here. Cyclone fans out there, help me. If you can think of something where we did something and you go, why the heck did they do that? Um, <coughs> understand. Um, okay, I'm going to come, I'm gonna, I've got one here, but I want to answer this. Um, 
on the, on the alcohol sales, you're right. Um, you know, I get the luxury. Well, Austin and I, again, we talk about a lot on the car ride down. When you're a public leader, um, you know a lot about things that the media or other people try to portray, and you just go, gosh, they don't have all the facts. You know? And so I've learned over time um, to be less judgmental of other things that go on in this world because I don't have all the facts, right? Um, so when I come back to you know the alcohol sales, um, I've got some information that you know we don't necessarily put out there overly public. But part of why we do what we do is um, I get access after every game to the sec security issues, and <coughs> you'd be amazed. Even though we try to be pretty liberal in the tailgating, what some people end up doing at the games. Um, and usually it's alcohol related. Not usually, it's almost always alcohol related. Um, and you look at it and you scratch your head and you go, boy, there's some real idiots out there. But um, those idiots usually cause problems for other people that are just trying to enjoy the game or have kids there with them. And so if you put alcohol in the entire stadium, um, I mean, that's like lighting a match. And you're not going to have any moral high ground. And it, it cuts against the fabric of trying to say we're still trying to be somewhat family oriented. Um, now, on the other side of it too, I can uh, you know I'll just give you hard fact numbers. Hilton Coliseum, we have Johnny's. Okay, Johnny's is the club for those that are at twelve thousand five hundred dollars annually. They get to come into Johnny's. They can get alcohol at pregame, halftime, postgame. Um, total sales for Johnny's last year, and it's packed. Anybody here been in Johnny's yet? Okay, it's packed. Like last night, I mean, it's belly to belly. We're actually expanding it next year. Um, and, and they're mostly in there because they want that bottle of beer. Our total sales was $80,000, okay? <coughs> Got a $64 million budget. $80,000 is a pimple, okay? Since New York City last year in the Sweet 16 and the start of this basketball season, we added 52 members to the directors. That's 52 times 12,500, okay? Do the math. That's about $600,000 in just club memberships, okay? So the money's not in the alcohol. The money's in the access to the room where you can have the alcohol. So we get the best of both worlds. If we put it out there and let everybody buy it, we wouldn't make as much money and we'd create a whole bunch of issues, which would end up costing us money. Um, Early on, I, this is probably a bad example, but it was my activator and a little bit of uh, that fight. So uh, we had a really good gymnastics coach, KJ Kindler, really good. She'd won the Big 12 championships. Um, I think it was my second year on the job, maybe. Um, and usually what makes a coach pretty good is they're a pain in the, you know what, um, because they're demanding, okay? And she was very demanding for her sport. And... Um, you know, if she was still here, we could probably have addressed a lot of those needs. But she wanted to be first before we did anything with football or basketball or, and um, kind of drew that line in the sand that I'm going to go to Oklahoma. And so my reaction was to come out fighting because I didn't want it to be seen as, you know, we got a, one of our coaches is going to leave and go to another Big 12 school. You know, that's going to look bad to us. So I came out kind of attacking in the, in the media. And, and, you know, I don't think I, I, I didn't attack her as much as I attacked the facts and said, here's what we offered to pay. Here's what we did this or did that. And it just was the wrong move because people were offended that I actually talked about that publicly. Um, and so I would have done that differently. Probably wouldn't have still kept her here because she was going to go someplace. I wish she still was here, not because I don't like our current gymnastics coach, but she's really good. But it was the wrong time for her probably to be making those kind of demands. But I clearly let my activation get in the way of should have probably just kept it internal. Because at the end of the day, I hope nobody's going to be offended by this. You know, I'm a cross-country track guy, okay? I, so I get people want to talk about basketball and football, right? It was gymnastics. So the bulk of people could have cared less. But I made it a story in the paper. And... So to people that didn't even know who she probably was or didn't even know anything about gymnastics now saw me talking negatively about one of our coaches that was leaving. And so that was perceived poorly as it should have been. Way in the back.
Well, it wasn't that I didn't want to talk about the logo. It just was when you get asked to talk about brand, that's what first comes to mind. And I was going, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about this. So here, the deal with the logo was simply this, is when I first started, the number of people that would say to me, change the logo. I mean, we're, we're, we got blue. Blue's not even a school color. We got this thing going on that's really hard to put, stand up. It doesn't really sit upright. Um, we had this goofy thing going on. You're right about stringent. We had this goofy, I mean, we used to laugh internally. I, we, when we were flying on football trips, we'd laugh about this. Technically, if you, if you go back and look, okay, there were two ways we did the little whirly bird, okay? One said ISU and one said Iowa State. There were guidelines. If you were in the state, you were supposed to always be wearing something that said ISU, and if you were leaving the state, you were supposed to wear it saying Iowa State. So we used to laugh when we were flying, like, out of state. Have we crossed the border yet? Okay, switch shirts, coaches. Um, so it, we just, it, it, and then when you try to put it on a shirt or put something up here, it was just kind of like a little smudge thing. Um, and you know what? I, I don't mean that in a negative way. Is because when people, I believe people get up in the morning and try to do their best. And so somebody made that decision and made that logo and, um, and was very proud of it and, and, it, and it worked. But there was a time where we just felt, well, it needed to be refreshed. What I had said is I don't want to, typically what happens is a new football coach comes and they want to change the helmet, okay? And so um, changing logos is like moving graves. Be careful what you wish for. So Gene Chiswick was coming, so it was a perfect opportunity to say, this is our chance. You know, when Hayden came, that's how they got the Hawkeye logo that they have now. So we, um, we embarked upon a process where we tried to get input. We had the School of uh, Design involved and had some students involved. And ultimately, we came up with what we thought was more of an iconic logo that was, number one, cardinal and gold, and number two, brought back the eye because that's what our letter winners wear. It's an eye. You get an eye letter in cardinal and gold. And so um, we felt we needed to put state on there because Iowa had then taken over using the eye for their um, symbol and some things for their letter winners or for their letter... Or their their annual fun club. Um, and so that's what was kind of the thought process that went into it was how can we have more of an iconic logo that's just identifiable and it's not a mascot logo. I think the old logo was trying to do two things. It was trying to take the mascot and an iconic logo and putting it all together and it was too much. Um, and that's where the blue came from. The blue wasn't somebody deciding they want blue to be a school color. Our school color or our cardinal and gold. And you can debate it all day long. No one's right what cardinal really is. You know, because people view the cardinal as the red bird. But if those of you that deal with colors and um, know what I'm talking about, cardinal is actually a little deeper red color. And what had happened at Iowa State is we'd become bright red and bright yellow. Okay? Those are two colors that don't go together very well unless you put another dark color in there. And that's where the blue came from. And so the blue started to become a school color. So there was some thought process that went through it, but I will say this, um, this would be a ask for forgiveness later. Um, I was new and we had a president that was very supportive of athletics and we knew in athletics, whatever went inside of that helmet was gonna drive, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. Like it or not, athletics drives a lot of things, okay? So we knew whatever went inside of that helmet would become what it is. Well. We just said we're just changing the logo on the side of the helmet. Okay? And we did that, and it took on a life of its own. The university's marketing staff was not very happy with us because they wanted it to be the other way and wanted it to be the brighter red and the um, and so you know the cow got pretty far out of the barn before anybody fully realized what was happening. We knew what was happening. Um, and I think in the long run, though, we forced an issue that I, I mean, I don't hear any questions about our logo anymore, where my first couple of years in the job, that was one of the most, it was either television coverage for our football games, the logo, um, and our radio coverage throughout the state were the three biggest things. And I don't hear anything about the logo anymore. So I think most people have accepted it and, 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 and appreciate it for what it is. And we've locked in. We switched football coaches again, and that was... Again, on our car ride down, I was telling him about when I met with Paul Rhodes the second time, and we just um, we met in a hotel for about four hours, and it was one of those I just said, I've got from A to Z, 
that I need to know about if we're going to hire you as a football coach. And the number one thing, one of the things on A to Z was uh, L, logo. I said, we're not switching logos. You're taking what we have. We're not switching to anything. He said, I'm fine with that. So it's like, okay, because I wasn't going to go through that a second time. <laughs> we doing okay time-wise? I am. Right here in the middle. Well, so you know, athletics has no problem with you using it. That's being governed by the university's marketing office because they want to keep that separate and um, can't win all the battles. But um, I always bristle when people tell me that, not it to you, but that means there's people over there still saying that. But we, you can use it whenever you want, however you want, and we will applaud it, okay? Um, now you've got to fight that battle with the university's marketing arm. Um, because they, it goes back to the person that created that first logo is on that staff. And, and has good intentions. Has good intentions. And so I, um, it's just we have a difference of opinion. And that opinion prior to our making the I-State logo was driving what we did in athletics. And we said we're not going to let that drive athletics anymore. Now, if you look at most institutions, the athletic logo drives everything. Um, at our institution, that one part is still trying to hold on. And um, you know, we got what we needed. And I, you know, I can only, I'm only going to fight the fight so far. <laughs> There's nothing left for me to gain on that part of it. So, But you aren't the first area that's told us that. But if you want to use it, green light it. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, Cyclone TV, how now you have your own media outlet? how that's different from pushing out marketing and now you have control over your media outlet, um, how that kind of came to be and are you hands off with it now or hands on? Well, I'll try to give a short answer because I got Angela up here and I know we're time's short here. But um, it, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to continue to, to spread the brand and capitalize on a lot of the things that we've talked about here um, because it gives us the ability to pump out what we want when we want. Um, and we've been able to do it very efficiently. You know, it's, it's through Mediacom and how it, why it's through Mediacom is because Mediacom is the cable subscriber on campus. So the pipeline from Des Moines to actually goes through Hilton Coliseum. So whenever we do any live coverage, all we're doing is using the video that we show on the video board. So we're not doing any extra production and we don't have to zap anything up on a um, satellite. So we eliminate all those costs, which would be a burden to having your own station. And so we're able to put all that stuff up essentially free. And then part of the deal was we had, a, we, have a, we had a few events of inventory, the one football game and a couple basketball games that the Big 12 lets us use, that we usually went out and sold. And typically ABC got it, some other um, over-the-air stations around the state. What we wanted was the ability to have our own station. So we went to Mediacom and said, if we give you those big pieces of inventory that we know you'd love, would you give us a station all year round, 24-7, in, in HD? <coughs> and they agreed to do that, which then allowed us to, we build all kinds of shoulder programming, features and old replays, and it gives us the ability to have something there all the time. And technology is changing by the second. Um, one of the things that changed six months ago, because you used to be able to get on the internet if you weren't Mediacom, and you could you know, go in and just click on whatever you wanted to watch. But an app was developed that allows you actually now to go on and see live TV. So you can go to our website, click on live TV, and you're actually watching that channel on Mediacom without having to have Mediacom. Now, you don't get other Mediacom channels, but you get our channel. Um, and you know the college kids today, most even don't even have TVs or cable. I mean, they're doing everything off their iPads or Slingbox or whatever. Hulu TV, I'm way out of my, over my skis here, so forgive me. But um, that's the future. And so we feel we're really well positioned. But in the meantime, we've got this great vehicle 
to spread the good word about Iowa State. Um, you know, uh, there'll be some time here in the future, I'm sure, where the institution's going to want to put some stuff on there, too. So, well, thank you so much.